female quotient audience and fair play audience. This is my favorite part of the week. This is our authors series. We've had some really amazing people this year, um, but I'm probably most excited to speak to my friend and fellow author, Erica Suter. Um, we've been talking about this book for a couple of years now, um, before mm -hmm. global pandemic was even on the radar, where we were mutually um, advocating together for uh, a world where you could have a kid and a life and survive um, mm -hmm. and thrive. So your book is a really beautiful roadmap. So let's just hold it up. How to have a kid in the life, a survival guide. Order it today. It is, you can read it in a day. It's a beautiful, really, really important and practical read. So welcome, Erica. I want, before we talk about today and the shit show that um, that is, <laughs> is why we need your book even more than ever, where survival is actually the right word. Um, can we first, can you introduce yourself? Tell us everything about you. What made you want to write this book? And again, thank you for your vulnerability because sometimes in nonfiction, mm -hmm. you add yourself in and that can be hard. So again, thank you yeah. for your adding yourself in this book. It was extremely, extremely relatable. So tell us everything about why, why before the pandemic, what we're thinking about anything, um, what, anything that inspired you to write again. This is what we're talking yeah. about. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been a writer for 20 years. I started my career as a journalist at People Magazine. So I really spent most of my life, uh, working life, interviewing, talking to people, trying to understand their stories and present them to the world. Well, when I started a family, um, I switched gears and I started writing about motherhood and families and the, and the struggles that new, uh, especially new and growing families went through. And um, there were so many things that resonated with me because I was also a new parent and I had a lot of struggles that I just didn't, I didn't know other people could relate to. And I was a little hesitant to share when I was, you know, was overwhelmed or felt completely depleted or burned out because we're kind of bombarded with this message that we should just be grateful that we have families and just be grateful that we have children and this is our most important role and it's what we're meant to be. Well, that didn't quite jive with me. I kind of felt like I was thrown into the ocean without a life jacket. And I came across this research while I was at Cafe Mom on the mom gene. And there's, actual, there's an actual gene that these scientists have isolated that they think will determine how nurturing you are or you know, when your biological clock starts ticking or how much you um, dive into motherhood and just love it, right? So I thought, oh my God, maybe I don't have a mom gene. You know, I'm like, I love my, my kids, but this is really hard. And um, so I wrote an essay about it. And then uh, the title was, uh, is discovery of the mom gene, the reason some of us don't crave having kids. And the reaction I got was huge. So many women wrote to me talk, saying that they felt the same way, you know, they're mothers, but it just never, you know, they, they just never felt natural or it was hard for them. They love their kids. They're so happy to have families, but it's such a struggle. And is this why? And that made me think there are so many things that are happening in our world that we're not talking about. Right. When we prepare for parenthood, it's always about the list of the best car seat, the best baby carrier, to wipe warmer or no wipe warmer, what your nursery looks like. Um, but we never really talk about all the changes that happen in a woman's life that really don't have anything to do with taking care of a baby day to day. And that's your marriage, your friendships with other women, your career, your, your self image and self esteem. And I wanted to write something that addressed all of those issues and more, and then also provide ways to, you know, kind of come out on top and not let those things completely burn you out, which is what was happening to me. And I think a lot of the women around me. Even before the pandemic, I think that's, oh. you were the canary in the coal mine. Um, yeah. It's funny because your mom, Jean article reminds me of uh, when I had this like, Kaiser Soze moment, that attachment theory, you know, that theory where you're <laughs> not like real attachment, like Winnicott, like you should attach to your child, like the attachment theory of like your child sleeps in your bed and they should never mm -hmm. be off your boob for two years. Um, <laughs> it was, of course, written by a man. Um, <laughs> right. So, so we're going to just burn the mom gene and attachment theory and anything else mm -hmm. that 
can add any sort of guilt and shame or prescriptive nature for how you parent. Because again, what I think that's so beautiful about your book is it's not prescriptive, but it it is truth telling. And I think it goes through each every, of every theme um, that checks off what are the costs, what can be the costs to not addressing these issues um, before you have kids. So I'll add you to my cadre of women that I call the ghost of Christmas future. Um, Cause mm-hmm. I think everybody should read this of course, but especially um, the, I'd say the millennials, next gen, gen Z, the ones who are coming up behind us. So thank you for writing yeah. it. So let's dive in, um, to <laughs> next, let's dive into survival. Um, you know, of course, I just want to go into um, the mental load, but we're, we'll, we'll get there. Um, that's my favorite chapter, of course. Um, but let's let's just talk a little bit about um, the myth of modern mother, motherhood. Mm-hmm. I think this mm-hmm. is really important because I was thinking that you you sort of like added it was like a cauldron, and we're like let's just drop in all like the, the stuff that can poison us, right? There's all these myths. Right. There's like a sprinkle a splash of the motherhood penalty. Uh, There's a splash of societal expectations that you're supposed to sacrifice everything. So finally you get this big brew that literally it's like hemlock. It can just kill us all. Um, So, so can you talk a little bit about these um, myths of modern motherhood and the ones that you found um, most toxic and also your, because what's so beautiful about your book is you break it into sort of the, the real um, and how we should really about think about these issues. So if you could talk to us a little bit about the myths and then the reality. Yeah. So I think one of the biggest myths that a lot of women, no matter how they became mothers, right? Some women planned for their whole lives. Some women were like literally debating whether or not they should be moms up until the delivery. <laughs> uh, other, you know, a lot, some women went into a complete ambivalence. But no matter how you enter motherhood, what I found is that a lot of women felt that it should be the thing that completed them, right? This should be the thing that makes you the most happy. And even when that wasn't the thing that made them or the only thing that made them happy, they they beat themselves up about it. They felt a lot of guilt about it. Right. So I think that was one of the biggest myths that I think women need to kind of go into motherhood knowing that it will be, yes, the most important thing you do, or one of the most important things you do, but it doesn't have to be the only thing you do. It doesn't have to be the only thing that you are, right? You you were a multifaceted, dynamic person before you had kids. That person is still in there and you just have to give her a little time and attention. And so that was one of the biggest things that I wanted to, to bring out. But then there are other things too, like I, one of, one of my favorite chapters to write was of course, um, the chapter on mom friendships, right? And so um, we all think like, okay, we're gonna have these mommy friendships. And it's kind of like, oh, if your uterus was occupied the same time as mine, we're gonna be BFFs. And it doesn't really work. I love work. that chapter so much because you describe in the beginning of that chapter, exactly how I felt like as a holistic, smart woman with tons of friends, the second I had my baby, it was like, I'm walking into that empty cafeteria, as you said. Yeah. yeah. Looking yeah. for a table with my tray. And just, and just praying that someone talks to me. So I love I love how you write about what it what it's like to redefine friendships. So I think yeah. So let's go let's go into the different areas because I think okay. one of these areas is about um, our happiness, our fulfillment, and they are mm-hmm. the myth of modern mother, motherhood. As you talk about when you have to sacrifice it all, um, these things mm-hmm. become last on our list. Um, so let's talk. So let's start with friendships because that is a good one. You're about to say it. But again, so what happens when you walk into that cafeteria with an empty tray? Yeah, it's like it's like you're a junior high school kid and you're at the plate, you know, you're like, who's going to sit with me? Who's going to talk to me? Who's going to be my friend? And that's what it kind of feels like when you're searching for mom friends, because that's what we're told we're supposed to do, right? Go to playground, playgrounds, go to mommy groups, go to mommy meetups, you know, the preschool drop off and you're supposed to find friends. And a lot of people had, you know, a list of moms they knew, right? But they still felt very lonely. And the problem is, is because, you know, quantity isn't quality and we're not investing the right amount of time in the relationships that are really going to feed us and support us. And so I write a lot about finding the right kind of mom friends, not just having just a list of people that you can say are mom friends. And so... I want women to also be picky. Like you're, you're allowed to pick your friends, right? You're allowed to, um, you know, feel like, no, I have a lot in common with this particular mom. I'm going to have one-on-one coffees with her. We're going to go for walks and we're going to spend time together. And you can cultivate that relationship. Because one of the big things I want moms to ask themselves is, 
How do your relationships make you feel? Do you leave interactions with these people feeling uplifted and supported? Did you laugh? Did you have a good time? But do you also feel comfortable being vulnerable? All of those are what make real friendships, not just, you know, you know, superficial conversations. I mean, especially in a time like this, you know, we really need people who are going to help us through these things. You know, I have a group of girlfriends. They're amazing. There are five of them. And during the pandemic, we spoke literally every day. What we would do, we set up a Zoom call from like 5.30 to 6. And at any point, if you could drop in, even just to be like, oh my God, I'm going to like run away. Or <laughs> if I had to cook dinner one more time, I'm literally going to go crazy. Or, you know, just to talk about, did anyone see the Real Housewives last night? Just basically, we knew that we were going to be there for that little 30 minute break to just check in with each other and be there. And sometimes the conversation was serious. Is my marriage going to survive this pandemic? And sometimes they were silly. Um, you know, I was potty training my <laughs> toddler at the time and it was like, a nightmare. So it was just having someone, these people to check in with, and they checked in with me. Like if they didn't hear from me from two days, someone, you know, my friend Anita, she was like, Hey, where are you, babe? Like what's going on? And that's really important. You know, I don't, I wouldn't say I have like a thousand girlfriends, but I know I have a handful of poor people who are there to help me through this hard time. And people really need that. Well, that was actually one of the questions. So I have questions that came in in advance from the Fair Play audience. And then again, we have questions that'll come in uh, in the chat. So of course, please put your questions in the chat or the Q&A uh, from the female quotient audience. But one of the questions um, was a pretty specific question, but I think it's important as we go. Mm -hmm. There was a question, there's almost like a question per, per area. So we'll start with the friendship question. And that was obviously with the pandemic, it is so much harder to find those serendipitous friendships or to be picky. Mm -hmm. So um, are, is there any advice that you have now in a more sort of um, stay away from me virtual world? Right, so I think that, I mean, there, there are two ways about it. And you can choose to have like two or three friends that you are going to be around and you feel that you're safe to be around or have the same kind of safety concerns as you. And you can do obviously outdoor things or if, if they're vaccinated and you're comfortable with that, you can spend time with them. But one of the other things that I did during the pandemic, it started off as research for my book. I joined almost every mommy group online you can imagine, right? Um, tattooed moms, <laughs> moms who make their own medicine. Like, I mean, do you have a tattoo? I, I, totally, I don't, but I have always wanted yeah. one. Okay, I was like, yeah, because I don't remember seeing any tattoos in my body unless it's I know. really that I wouldn't be looking. So. <laughs> But, you know, um, moms who grow their own food, you know, moms who are organic moms. And so what I realized that there's a group for everyone. And sometimes I'm on this site. There was even a group called Monster and Law Support Group. <laughs> and I joined that one. And what I noticed is that during these times of loneliness, like people would, you know, at 3 a.m., someone would be like, hey, is anyone up? I'm really struggling with something. And then um, you could either do a direct message or they would, there would just be a chat going on where we all would weigh in. And those little moments were also really helpful. Like, is anyone else's, you know, teenager not following the rules? What do I do? I'm so overwhelmed. And solution, because we don't have the answers to everything. Often it was about just having people that relate to you and who are listening, right? And so I'm still a part of a lot of these mom groups and the same, and the same thing happens. Like one woman was like, oh my gosh, my baby's coming. Um, they're going to, I have to the baby's coming early, I have to deliver early. And then I deliver my first child early. So I'm like, oh, here's what happened to me. Like, this is what you have to ask your doctor. And just things like that to make people feel connected and not alone. And you have to do that, but you have to get online and you have to go in to mommy meetups or on Yahoo or on Facebook or wherever and find these groups and connect with these people. And don't be shy about it because they exist because everyone is desperate for this connection. They exist because there are a million women and men like you who are also longing for a stronger connection. I was on the other day on one of them and uh, they were saying, hey, is, does anyone live in Kansas and want, want to grab coffee on Saturday with their kids? And there were people who were lived, you know, in that, that city and, and they were grabbing coffee on Saturday. And I think that that's what we have to let go of, this fear of reaching out and this fear of rejection, because if you are craving that connection, there are a million other people who are as well. 
Well, I think that's so important to normalize the loneliness after kids. And like I said, I thought your analogy of um, we all hated that feeling. If we can all just close our eyes, <laughs> what it felt like to have your tray in that middle school cafeteria or try to find um, what table you're going to sit at um, mm -hmm. or who's going to welcome you to their table. It is a very isolating time. And so I yeah. love the idea that you are also a proponent of saying that, you, yes, um, online communities aren't just crazy out there. They're actually good ones. Right. Good, um, they are. Find, you can find connection and it's about recognizing that one, uh, everybody feels this way. And two, mm -hmm. it's about being vulnerable and being willing to share. So thank you. And then talk a little bit about, um, so can we just talk, stay on friendship for one more minute? Because I think mm -hmm. it's also important um, to understand how you have a great chapter about people who don't have kids or, you know, we, we, we talk about that. <laughs> right. um, so can we talk, and that was another question from someone from Fair Play. Um, let me see what the exact, uh, yeah, no kidding. When your child-free friends think you are a jerk. Um, that was, I was laughing a lot <laughs> at that, um, that chapter. So I think let's just stay on friendships for a little bit because mm -hmm. we're talking to an audience of leaders, people, women who, a lot of women who are up and coming in their careers. And so what the child-free friends thing was interesting, that chapter for me as well, because my boss was a child-free woman that I considered a friend. And I think our relationship really did, and that, as I was having children back then, it really did suffer um, mm -hmm. after I had children and I, and it was hard to tell what was going on. And so you you have a great chapter where you sort of talk a little bit about the perspective from, from their, from, from your child free friend perspective um, or mm -hmm. boss or colleague. And so can you talk a little bit about that chapter and a, why did you write it? And yeah. can you talk a little bit about how do you maintain friendships and okay and i will just say it's not just child free it's anybody with a different family mm -hmm. structure anybody yep. who's in a different phase of their life um because it could feel very isolating if you have friends who have teenagers who say to you oh you have, you're in the easy phase right i mean there's just mm -hmm. so many different life stages we're all in and so i'd love that chapter to me was made me not only laugh because there is a lot of humor in your writing but it made me feel normalized that in different seasons maybe friendships aren't always um going to feel as smooth yeah. So that chapter was inspired by this conference I went to, and it was called the Not Mom Summit. And it was a um, conference celebrating not being mothers. And um, I thought when I, when I read about it, it was the first one that they'd ever held in the U.S. at the time. When I read about it, I was like, I've got to go. I've got to see because I'm surrounded by mothers and talk of motherhood and all this importance that's put on motherhood. I wonder what it's like to ha make a choice or know that you're never going to have children and what that's like. So I went to this conference and I went as an attendee. Talk about your research. I just want to just, can we just pause for a second? Oh say, yeah. You are an amazing researcher. Um, so this <laughs> is not just like Erica's tips on motherhood. This is <laughs> a beautifully well-researched book. Sorry, I just needed to say that because everything you're saying is just so fascinating. It's all coming out of places, online communities. Oh yeah. On, uh, you have stats, everything is study-based. Yeah. So I, I appreciate your rigor. Okay, keep going. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I, I spoke to like 150 moms, I researchers, uh, therapists, yeah, everyone. I just wanted to get a, a full picture of what was going on in the world and what people felt and what they hated, what they loved, what they would change and uh, what would help. So that's that's where this all came from. So when I saw this conference, I was like, well, I want to go and find out what not moms feel about motherhood and moms. And it was really eye opening because I always thought that the big division among women um, was, you know, mother, this whole judgmental mom world that we live in and moms judging other moms. Well, I realized that a, a, another division is mothers versus not mothers and how sometimes we make these women feel right like um what i learned was that there are a lot of like microaggressions that that women who don't have children who don't want children suffer and it's from just even asking when are you gonna have kids don't you want kids you're gonna regret the choice later okay couldn't find the right guy like or what are you gonna do in the holidays who's gonna take care of you when you're old um aren't you lonely like all of those things make women who have chosen not to have kids feel that their life choice isn't valid all right. And no one ever celebrates their choice. And so I really, when I sat at this conference, I remember it was the first time I was embarrassed 
to be a mom because I was like, I hope no one asked me if I had, you know, <laughs> I have kids because I'm going to feel like a traitor to this group. And, um, and no one did because, of course, the expectation was that no one had children. But it was just really fascinating to just sit there and listen to um, people who were very happy that they had made the decision not to have kids and had focused their lives on academic pursuits or career or travel or sport sports like there were athletes there and it was just really interesting to listen to um, their perspective and on the other end there were people there who called themselves not moms by chance and there were women who had gone through many cycles of IVF or just couldn't get pregnant and um, and they were sad that that wasn't going to be a part of their life but they were accepting it and they wanted to be in a group and around people who understood um, life without children. So um, it was a really profound experience, but talking to these women, it was also kind of um, kind of funny because they were they were so proudly not moms, and they just shared so much about how they want their lives to be celebrated just as much as people celebrate women with children. And one of the things, so I wrote about how we can do that, right? Like, so we talk about milestones for our kids, right? they have milestones in their lives, new jobs, buying a house, buying a new car, getting, um, graduating from something, accomplishing some other goal. Like we have to celebrate that as much as we do, like, you know, Annie's ballet recital, you know, preschool ballet recital, like all of those things are still worthy and wonderful accomplishments. And we have to recognize that in our friends who don't have children. And I think we also have to make sure they're still a part of our lives. What I noticed is that a lot of mothers Maybe it was like not on purpose, but well, they start cutting out their friends who don't have kids, right? Well, so and so is not going to want to come to a five year old's birthday party or, you know, Christmas at our house is nuts now. Why would my friend who doesn't have kids want to be there? That's not true. They want to be there. They want to be invited. They want to be included. And that was also like a really important lesson. And then also, just it's just really basic. Like, we don't reach out. Moms, we're so busy, we're so overwhelmed with our kid having lives that we don't often reach out to our friends who don't have kids and they miss that connection. They feel really abandoned. Right. And so it's, it's as simple as, you know, after I wrote the chapter or while I was writing the chapter, I reached out to a friend of mine who doesn't have kids. I hadn't talked to her in I don't know how long because I was impossible to schedule anything with. I was always so busy. I was always just so frazzled. And I was just like, you know what, I'm going to stop this. I'm going to prioritize it. And now we have this great re rekindled relationship. We have a lot of fun together and we have a lot in common that has nothing to do with kids. And I think moms have to realize that, or people, you know, people, children have to realize that, that you have interests and you have things to say that are interesting and worthy that don't have anything to do with your kids. So. I love that so much because I think that that was really important to me. Um, my friends who did not have kids were the ones who started to remind me that it wasn't okay to lose my identity after having children, mm -hmm. that it was not okay to be in groups where people are just talking about what diaper bag they're going to buy for an hour yeah. Yeah. or um, not even ask you your full name, just call you Zach's mom, that uh, you're a real human, that um, your education matters, that your work matters. Uh, what do you do for fun still matters. Um, and so mm -hmm. oftentimes I think people, while it's so important for that loneliness to have, as you said earlier, the friends who can relate um, to how hard it is. I also thought that chapter was so important and interesting because we don't talk about how people at different life structures and especially mm -hmm. women, our women friends who don't have children are really can be sort of our portal back to ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Like, a beautiful job writing about that. So thank you for, for that piece of the book. It was really funny and informative. Yeah, no, it was, it was really, it was, there, there were really some funny things that happened at the conference too, but I was kind of surprised about and I, and I write about them in the book, but it's, uh, I, I wanted to, people to take a look at, you know, the book is about motherhood, yes, but it's also about women's relationships in general. And that's really important. And, and really the kind of the crux of the message is that if you're not taking care of yourself or feeding your needs or um, don't have something for yourself, you probably aren't being the kind of parent and partner that you wanna be because your happiness does matter. And there was actually a ton of research in the book about how um, if you're unhappy, and even if you think you're hiding it, your kids know and they sense it and they feel it. So I want women to know that their happiness has, it's more about just them having fun, right? It's about how their whole life, their whole life and their, how, their, how their family lives and how it affects everyone around them. 
Oh, well, you know, we're going to get to partnerships soon because that's, you, you, <laughs> yeah. um, before we do that, um, uh, let's, can we go to, let's go to career. So friendships, I will say that, um, we did have a couple questions here, so yeah. I don't want to, I just don't want to just ignore. Um, so I do, Lisa asked, you know, I'm really looking forward to this book. We all are again, just, I like to do my infomercial and pause to say, <laughs> buy it and also please review it because authors, we get mm-hmm. algorithm help when our book is reviewed. So I just did yours, Erica. I try to do one. I spend an hour a week reviewing books and I, and it's, it's a very important hour for uh, people that uh, authors that I love. Yeah. Uh, Lisa says, I'm really looking forward to this book. I'm, I'm definitely struggling with making friends at this stage in your life. So any tips on how to meet people in real life? So I guess I was asking mm-hmm. from the fair play audience, how to meet people online when, we're in, in this COVID world, but I think Lisa's also wondering um, what's, you know, where, where do you find these elusive friends that you talk about in the book that are not the toxic friends that don't shame you, that don't oh, just yeah. have diaper bags? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think that you have to, I know, I know this is, to some people this sounds crazy, but if you're at it, if you're in a class, take a gym class, or if you're at work, or wherever you are, where you are around other people, you have to try to connect with those people. And it means putting yourself out in the limb. I have a huge fear of rejection. And I hate the idea of reaching out to some, like some, someone I don't know, and basically saying, will you be my friend? But as a grown up, I had to start doing that, right? Especially if they, you know, you see someone and maybe they're, you see them at your kids drop off every day. And you're like, oh, they've, you know, the couple of times we chatted, she seems so nice. And she, you know, you know, or you, I, I remember I made a really great friend. Her name is Sheila. And we were volunteering at the Christmas fair at a kid's school. And I didn't know if we really had much in common, but we were all, we were both there decorating. And so we started talking and then I you know we met for coffee and then we would work out together when we had a chance. And then, you know, it's just kind of like putting yourself out there and making that, making that connection and letting it grow. Now, sometimes it won't work out. Right. But we have to be willing to try because otherwise we'll never know, you know, and then sometimes someone asks me, someone's like, Hey, do you want to have coffee with me? And I'm like, Oh, sure. I'll go. It's like being willing. And during COVID, I remember there's a mom who I didn't know very well. She's like, do you mind, you know, do you want to take like a power walk along the West side highway? I live in New York city. And I was like, Oh, sure. You know, why not? It's outside. You know, we, it was safe. Um, and so it's, it's just being willing to put yourself out there, even if it's someone who you don't think you have a lot in common with, because, you know, first impressions are often wrong. You know, I, I don't believe in first impressions. I think you have to give people a chance. Now, if you give them a chance and you can't stand them, then move on. <laughs> but you still just have to, you have to like, you know, plant a seed to see if something will grow. Well, what I love, again, it just normalizes the vulnerability that we all have to be vulnerable. I think, again, I just keep coming back to the analogy uh, that you talk about, about being that. <laughs> I think it's very, very triggering. Um, it's been very triggering because at every stage of my life, when I was done making my best friends in college, I'm like, oh my God, I have to start again in law school. Mm-hmm. Then you're after school, you have to start again when you have kids. It just, it often feels very, very vulnerable. Um, and it can feel very, very lonely. So again, thank you just for normalizing that. And um Anybody out there, you know, you could always DM me. I'll always, I'll always be your friend too. And Eric is great. <laughs> me too. Um, but, but this is about a conversation about support. You know, at the end of the day, survival to thriving, you know, a lot of what you're doing, not only is normalizing hard things, but it's talking about support. So before we go on to partner support again, which is, you know, my favorite thing to talk mm-hmm. about, um, uh, there was a question about, we're going we're gonna to do career support and um and thriving but let's do because that's another chapter that i love but Lori keith asks what are your thoughts on postpartum support since we're talking about Mm. support night nurse doula if you don't have strong family support system near you and it's only you and your partner someone to jump in and provide a helping hand i'm having my first child and i'm wondering if this will be beneficial i mean my answer of course is going to be like hell yes times ten thousand million. but um (laughs) let's hear erica talk about it more from the research and from what what you yeah yeah. So what I found is that most m- most moms these days are living in what I call a familial desert. It used to be like a couple, generation ago, or even even it's still going on now in some parts of the country where you don't move away from your family, and so you have all this built-in support. 
So you have cousins and aunts and uncles and grandparents and parents and everyone there to kind of lean in, like lean into your life and help you out. Well, a lot of us don't have that because we've moved away for because of work or school or whatever, and we're living away from our families. So we have to kind of create that circle. So um, yes, what I, I immediately do need the support. I, I don't think anyone should go into it thinking that just them and their partner is all that they're going to need. But then it's like, how do you build that support? So if you can't afford to hire a sitter or a doula, even for a little or um, a night nurse, excuse me, if you can for a little bit of time, it's very important, especially in those first weeks when you really don't know what to expect from your body, right? your emotions. I mean, you cannot predict how you're going to respond. And it has nothing to do with whether or not you love your baby. Of course, you love your baby, but you have all of these like hormones surging through your body and you don't know how it's going to make you feel. So if you can't afford to have support, yes. Um, I did talk to mothers who created the support in their communities, right? So it's a little bit of give and take, right? They're new mothers and it's like, okay, can we, uh, every other day, you, you know, you come over my house and I go over your house and we spend some time together or I'll babysit your children and you can watch mine or um, leaning on neighbors who don't have kids who want to be involved and want to be connected to families, right? Um, calling friends, you know, if you don't ask your friends for help, then you, you won't know or colleagues. Like there was a, there was a mom at my school. I didn't even know um, how close we'd be, but I had a family emergency and she picked up my son from school. And that's how kind of how she had heard. And she called, she, was like, she lived in my neighborhood. And she's like, I can help you. Like I'll pay, I'll bring Lex home and you stay at the hospital and they'll be fine. And I was like, Oh my God, thank you so much. Right. And, um, and now I probably lean on her too much. <laughs> if I have an emergency. Okay. Right. But, but you, you have to take advantage of the support around you and then offer it in return. So the same thing with like, um, you know, the neighbor above me had kids the same age. And if I had to run to the store to get some Tylenol, children's Tylenol, I'd be like, do you mind if you just like watch my kids for like 20 minutes while I run to the market? Or, you know, it's just, it's leaning on everyone around you and not being afraid. You have to be vulnerable. You have to act. And then there, you also have coworkers. You know, I have friends from that I've made from work who don't have children, who I'm like, can you know, we became good friends. I'm like, can you be my emergency contact at my kid's school because it's near your house, <laughs> right? So they can run to pick them up if I can't get there in time, and or if there is an emergency. And it's having conversations with these people and letting them know how much you value them and how you want them to be a part of this experience, and that it's going to be hard for you, and you'd love to be able to lean on them. People like to be needed and I don't, don't discount that. So yes, if you don't have a lot of family around, you do have to actively create this village of people who will help you. And it's good. It might take a little bit of time, but you do have to extend yourself and also ask your husband or your partner, you know, they may have friends who have girlfriends or wives who have children who will be willing to help and step in and give you guys a helping hand. But yeah, you do definitely have to extend yourself and it's possible. And it's possible. Yeah, we're going to be talking about men soon, women married to men. So don't <laughs> don't you think that we're just saying this has to be all women? But we are saying that in your lived experience, we want you know we want to be super supportive here, and we recognize it is really hard to raise children in America, um, mm -hmm. and you do need things like <laughs> like survival guides, um, and and really again, like I said, this is more than a survival guide. What I love about your book, it's really about thriving because. Not only does it dispel myths, uh, lean into research, but it really offers some really beautiful practical tips um, uh, and and reframes for for lots of different mm -hmm. areas. Um, so again, I love. We're gonna get to we're gonna get to partners. Um, I wanna we're gonna spend the last probably ten minutes on that. But I do before that, I think it's really important to talk about career because mm -hmm. it's the female quotient. These we are here with you, beautiful people who are. Um, highly engaged in your careers. Um, Erica, you're very vulnerable about talking about your career in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk a little bit about the motherhood penalty. What happens after kids? Um, let's yeah. talk about that part of your book. Right. So, you know, the motherhood penalty is something that I, I felt like I experienced. So I definitely wanted, that's why I kind of start the book with it, because I think it's kind of the, one of the first shocks that a lot of working um, or women who work outside the home, you know, get, right? So you are 
you have a great career, you feel like it's in a solid place and you have a child and the perception of your work product completely changes. Like who you are as a, a professional is the perception completely changes. So a lot of women talked about uh, feeling like as soon as they came back from maternity leave, everyone thought their IQ took a nosedive or that they weren't offered as many opportunities for uh, taking on big projects or um, they were denied promotion and they felt it was because people just did not think that they could balance home and family or that their attention was um, going to be too focused on their family. Now, there's tons of research to back that up. Like from almost every major <laughs> university, there's, there are there's studies that show that regardless of work product, managers and supervisors typically feel that mothers are not as productive and not as reliable. But in reality, that is not true. Mothers are actually some of the best multitaskers. And if anyone who's raised <laughs> a child um, has the ability, has more patience, has good listening skills, um, is a great mediator, uh, can balance lots of things at once, we're amazing multitaskers. And so our, we actually are amazing you know, workers to have, amazing group leaders to have, but it's just getting past that perception that we, we can't possibly be as dedicated once we have kids. So I wanted women to kind of move forward knowing this, right? Knowing that this may happen, that's not gonna happen every place, but knowing it may happen, and then kind of work toward making sure that everyone around them knows that their work product is good and that they are dedicated. Now that's not to say you can't prior, prior, prioritize going to leave for your kid's recital or doctor's appointment or whatever, because that's equally important. But we really need these businesses and these organizations to change their perception of mothers and give us, you know, I hate to say it, but the benefit of the doubt, right? And give us the support that we need in order to be productive employees and productive and in, in good family members. I don't know, that's kind of- That's right. Um, oh, and then the other thing that I found was, because this actually happened to me, like, you know, I, I have very rarely meet a woman who thinks that they can get laid off on maternity leave, but it actually is quite possible and actually happens a lot in this country. And that's also something that's really shocking and unexpected. And there are definitely things that you can do to protect yourself before you go on maternity leave to make sure that your job is secure when you get back. And I talk about that in the book as well. Mm -hmm. Well, that I thought that was a really important part of the book uh, mm -hmm. to recognize that we are here to, as Michelle King says, uh, you know, fish, fix workplaces, not women. And so to recognize mm -hmm. that it's not you and it's not um, it's not uh, fiction, um, you know, when yeah. that, uh, see, everybody has a story like that. My all my mm -hmm. direct reports were taken away from me when I was on maternity mm -hmm. leave. Um, and again, it was just happened to be given to somebody else, but, um, again, nothing direct about the fact that I had a child at home, but you start to feel you're already feeling, as we said earlier, lonely, isolated, <clears throat> trying to create a friend group, trying to figure out the division of labor in the home. And then it can feel very like the, you know, nail in the coffin when, um, your workplace starts treating you differently. It can feel really, really yeah. bad. Um, and so again, I think you normalizing that this is a phenomenon, that this mm -hmm. is a workplace issue, um, it's a legal issue. Yep. Uh, there are there are a lot of policies and um, legalities around um, around discriminating against against people protected classes, um, like mothers um, or mm -hmm. people or same sex couples who've brought in a baby who is the primary caretaker. Or anyway, mm -hmm. um, so even policies and workplaces that have a primary caregiving leave and a secondary caregiving leave, those aren't the best, uh, may not even be legal anymore in some states. So, um, so thank you because you do a good job, a really great job uh, going through the motherhood penalty and the fact that it is not you. So we're here to tell you. Yeah, it is not you. It is not you. And then, you know, I think being more vocal about it. And also if your company has like a parenting group, or maybe you can start a group of like, the parents of whatever company that where it's in-house parents where you can kind of, you know, talk about these issues and make sure that, you know, everyone knows that you guys know, you know, your rights and you know, what's right and what's wrong, what's fair, what's legal and what's, you know, and that also helps 
bring a little bit of comfort to you in an organization. And the organization also knows that that's something that they need to be mindful of. But I think parents in organizations can definitely mobilize and form groups. And, I, and I've heard of a lot of corporations who now have parenting, like um, little subgroups that go on, like the same way they have like for, you know, workers of color or whatever, there, there's, you know, parenting groups. Yeah, join your ERG if you can. Um, yeah. Like Lucila says, I think being a mom is making me better at my job. I 100% agree. Yep. Um, so let's close out with the, the topic that's closest to my heart, which is yeah. um, men, <laughs> women, women who are married to men um, and are the amazing statistic that two thirds or more of what it takes to run home and family fall on women. Um, and you do also a beautiful job talking about cognitive labor that a lot of it is the, the mental load, the figuring out, the checking off, the researching the registry, the remembering, the monitoring, right? I call that conception planning and execution and fair play, but this idea that there's cognitive labor that falls on us that can burn us out. Um, so we know the problem. Uh, I talk about it a lot, obviously, but I, I, you have some really nice communication tips for, Mm -hmm. um, for how to communicate what you need from your partner. So uh, let's jump to that. um, If that's possible, I thought it was really, really helpful. Um, You also have a beautiful uh, quote in the book about uh, supporting who you want to become, right? That talk about dreams, your plans, um, the bigger picture, uh, not Mm -hmm. just uh, the small things. So you have a unique, so again, this book is, I'll just, say again, it's how to have a kid in life. This book is full of beautifully practical ways. You give people lots of tips, but let's talk a little bit about communicating what you need. Cause I think those tips are mm-hmm. applicable to all relationships, especially after yeah. you have new needs. Um, yeah. So let's, you say how to communicate what you need. So you have um, six, six tips. So t- can you just talk a little bit about uh, how you came with those six tips and what, what, ending on some practical steps for people as we leave. Yeah, of course. And just to let you know, I also interviewed um, moms in same sex relationships. So what I found was even if you're both women, (laughs) there's still someone who takes on more of the mental load. There's someone who, as you call the default parent, right? So, or the she fault. (laughs) So it's, (laughs) <laughs> so it's definitely it a pronoun. You can still be a sheep bald parent. It just, that, yes. that's what the <laughs> expectation of society. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I think one of the most important things is don't let the tension mount. And that's what something that I think every single woman I talked to had the built up all of this tension and resentment. And it was because their partner isn't doing what they think they should be doing. And oftentimes um, partners, uh, men and women have different ideas of what is a worthy contribution. <laughs> Right. So, so, so sometimes you need to like, not wait for them to just intuit what you think they should be doing. You need to express what you need and what you want them to do. Right. And that's just, you know, I, I, I thought like I spent years in like what I call squinty eyed rage at my husband because he just wasn't doing what I thought like he should be doing. And then finally I was like, well, let me just tell him how to help me in the morning to get the kids out the door. And then I did. And then it was like the solution I needed. Sometimes you just need to be honest about what's going to make your life easier, give you a little bit more time and a little bit less of like this overwhelming sense of rush that we often feel when we're dealing with our family and and their needs. So um, by doing that, it helps not to let the tension out and expressing things when they happen, right? If you just wait and you just let it just sit with you, and just be angry with it, that's never gonna lead to someplace good. And I'm a big advocate now of talking about things, not when I'm like, what are you doing? I can't believe this happened, you know? But just saying, hey, do you mind Mm -hmm. doing it this way next time? Or do you mind, you know, can we do it this way? And then that way um, you're gonna get a lot more, although you're gonna get the response that you want when you're not yelling and you're not incredibly angry. But it takes practice and you really have to work at the way you communicate with your spouse or your partner to let them know what they're doing wrong <laughs> and how yeah. to help you. Yes. Um, and you, but you actually have to be practical with it. And I, and this is something I, I really took from Eve's book as well. Like, you know, if, if you have more bandwidth in your day, there are certain things that your partner can't do and probably shouldn't do. 
right? So you kind of have to be practical and fair about how you divide the labor. But that that's not to say they're not they should still do more. There's, it's more, more than likely your partner still needs to do more, but you have to be honest about, you know, they, they may not be able to drop off that little league every night. That might just not, their schedule just doesn't work that way, but there are things that they can do in the home that kind of lighten your load that make you feel like you have a partner. Right. And, and those are the kind of things that you can like, I, I feel like need to talk about and like divide up. And as Eve's, that's fair play so amazingly does it really helps you lay those things out and it 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 lets you discuss them too I mean it's so Eve has laid out all the duties so well like it really like you you can't you don't miss anything and I think those those conversations are important to have you know you can do it over dinner or at a picnic or when things are when you're relaxed I think the point is to communicate these things not in anger but when you're really like hey let's be partners let's like figure this out and work this out um so yeah so the designating the jobs huge and again, don't assume they should know what they should be doing. You really have to let them know what your expectations are and your needs are and stop keeping score. So many women I talk were just like, um, you know, well, I did this and you didn't do that. That immediately puts your partner on the defensive and it doesn't make for any kind of positive like conversation. And then the last thing I think is really important is let go of the way things used to be. Your life is different now. If you have kids, everything is different. You are different. Your relationship is different. Your lifestyle is different. You have to create new normals and new ways of functioning as a family. Well, what a beautiful way to end. I know we're (laughs) at our time, but if there's one last thing that you wanted to leave the audience with, uh, what would it be? You have to put yourself back on top of your to-do list. This doesn't mean you're taking away anything from your children. It means that you are giving something to yourself, which is going to make you a better parent. I promise you it would. It will. You have to have something that's just for you, that has nothing to do with your family or kids, something that makes you feel good, something that feeds a part of you that you've neglected. Please do that. And I, and you will be happier. I, I guarantee it. And where can people find you? <laughs> Oh, well, you can find me. Um, I am on Instagram er, uh, at Erica Suter. I have a website where I update my work and my TV appearances and my writing at ericasuter.com. Um, yes, and I'm on Facebook as well. And uh, I'm just constantly writing. And I love sharing like how to make your life better with the world, whether it's health, whether it's family. So definitely look out for me. Congratulations for being on the side of Good Morning America. <laughs> so exciting to see your beautiful big book um, cover um, as a giant, giant side of GMA. Um, so I'm super, super proud of you. Um, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, just getting pings from Fair Play, pings from here. Just saying thank you for this amazing discussion. Really, really, um, everybody go out today. How to have a kid in a life. Uh, it's funny. It's well-researched and It's really, really great advice. So I can't wait. Hopefully we can go and do something in person. uh, I hope so. Um, But I'm glad we got to, I got to see your face today. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, Eve. This was great. All right. Talk to you soon. And for everybody on video recording, uh, thank you for also watching after. Okay. Bye.